Welcome, everybody. We're so glad you're here. This um, could be my favorite Falmouth Education Foundation event. I love this event because it's a chance to hear from teachers about their FEF funded projects. These are my three minutes to welcome you, to review the schedule for the evening, and to tell you everything you need to know about the Falmouth Education Foundation. But first, uh, first thing I want to do with my three minutes is remind you to silence your cell phones. The second thing I want to do is to, is to give some thanks. Um, first, to the FEF board and committees. They are smart and skillful, unfazed by hard work, dedicated to the Falmouth Education Foundation. They are the best. So if you are an FEF board member or committee member, could you just stand for a second, please? Thank you. And I want to thank one of them particularly, even though she hates being singled out, and that's Tracy Bushy. Where's Tracy? Who coordinated this event. Thank you, Tracy. I want to thank Peter Cook, who's the IT department head at the library, and Ryan Weber, our FEF hero, who helps us with all things audiovisual. Um, I want to thank um, Lori Doerr, our superintendent, who's here. Thank you, Lori. If you haven't had a chance to meet her, you should. It's a treat. Um, Lori took the time in her first very busy months to learn about FEF. She's interested in visiting some projects with us. Um, she gets us. And it's clear that FEF and the Falmouth Public Schools will continue to be strong and collaborative partners. The schedule. Um, you're, you're going to hear from several of our wonderful grantees. Um, and the schedule is that each pr presentation will be about 12 minutes long. Ellen Hewitt, our board member, is our timer. She'll give a two minute warning to the presenters and then they'll wrap it up in 12 minutes. Um, we're gonna save questions until the end, but I hope you will save your questions and I hope you'll jot them down um, about the organization, about any of the presentations, please do. And now, uh, the everything you need to know part. Um, I can tell you lots of things about the Falmouth Education Foundation. I can tell you the kinds of grants we offer. We have larger traditional grants, we call them, and smaller mini grants. I can tell you that since 2006, FEF has awarded 525 of them for a total of $905,000. Projects big and small, all schools, grades, content areas. And I can tell you that all of them were outside the school's operating budgets, meaning that none of them could have happened without FEF funding. I can tell you that very excitingly. Um, this will probably be the year in which we give away, cumulatively since the beginning, a million dollars to the Falmouth Public Schools. So we're growing, and we plan to keep growing. Our district is full of thoughtful, creative practitioners with excellent ideas for enhancing teaching and learning, and we want to say yes to as many of them as we can. But it's important not only to say what we do, but also why we do it. I came across a quote the other day. There is a place in America to take a stand. It is public education. FEF is grounded wholeheartedly in that belief. The stand we take is that strong public schools are essential to strong communities and in fact to democracy. That in spite of the budget constraints faced by public education, every child deserves excellence and opportunity and access to educational adventures. Falmouth's generous community of donors back that belief, and Falmouth's talented educators bring it to life. I am so glad you're here to listen to seven of them tell you how they do that. We hope it brings you closer to what FEF is all about. <coughs> Something really special happens when teachers talk about their work. What comes through is their willingness to go the extra distance on behalf of their students, their dedication, their sense of adventure, and their curiosity. It's fitting that the list of presentations on your program, it's on the back side of the blue paper, is in the form of questions. Because so often, FEF projects begin with curiosity, with a question, with a what if. 
Our first one. With a deep commitment to the success of all their students, Lawrence Principal Tom Bushy and Assistant Principal Rebecca Vieira wondered how to provide the right kind of support for students returning to school after extended, often medically significant absences. Please welcome Tom and Rebecca. Thank you. Thanks, Alan. Uh, is it okay if I just start? Yeah, so yeah. can you do that just so that oh, yeah. Brian can do Sure. Great. Is that all right, Ryan? <laughs> so uh, thanks, Alan, and uh, thanks, Tracy, for putting this great event together. Uh, I want to say I'm actually humbled and honored to be introduced as uh, a teacher. It was really nice to hear Alan say this is teachers get to, get to uh, talk about their programs because I am an administrator now, but no one in the profession starts out as an administrator, as far as I know. And in fact, I was having a conversation with a kid today who was like, you were a teacher at one point? And he just, was, just couldn't understand it. Uh, so <clears throat> we're going to talk about our bridge program. And we are going to, we were planning on going back and forth here, Ryan, if that's OK, if we move the microphone. We'll just, oh, OK. You want to give me the overview slide? Oh, okay. Sorry. So, uh, off the bat, uh, none of what you're going to see here could have been accomplished without uh, Falmouth Education Foundation and uh, the uh, funds that they provided us to create a membership uh, with the Bridge Program, uh, the, the Bright Program out of Brookline. And some of you may have heard about the High Schools Bridge Program. And just a, a very quick overview here. We were looking at what the high school was doing at the bridge program. We knew they had a lot of students. They were helped transitioning back for medical, uh, medical leaves or mental health scenarios. And we knew that the issues were you know, starting at the younger ages, grades seven and eight at the Lawrence School. We, ha we saw some numbers that we thought were, uh, we thought were too, you know, they were too big to say, this is just a high school problem. So we started to look re really closely at the numbers. And we worked with Mary to meet Paul and Catherine, who you'll hear more about over the course of the presentation, and they said, yep, this supports starting a program here at the Lawrence School. So we learned more about the program, we learned what we needed to do to make it happen, and we're going to take you through some slides about the process. Mrs. Pierre is going to talk about the four S's, and that's okay. And again, the process. And we're really young and new at this, but we're really proud to talk about the strides we've made so far, and I think that you're going to be you're going to be pretty pleased, and we've already invited some people to come take a look. So, uh, so the uh, the impact right away, like I was saying, Catherine and Paul. I do not know how to say Paul's last name. We got to on first name basis right away, so, uh, <laughs> and uh, they are they are extraordinary. They they teleconference with us. They come to visit us. Uh, they they offer to invite us to area professional development programs that they're going to be at. And we've been working really closely with them. They're always available to us to call on the phone or to email. And just having them there has been worth the uh, membership fee right away. I mentioned the professional development conferences. We, we recently hired a, a, a teaching assistant to be part of the program as the academic coordinator. And we've already sent our teaching assistant to go visit some other schools where they have bridge pro programs in the area. She's obviously been to the high school. She's been to uh, Bourne Middle School and Mashpee Middle School. There are two kind of different ways to run a, a bridge program, the high school model and a middle school model. And we're working through that process to do what's best for Falma. Another uh, one of the uh, opportunities that you get with the membership is the online data portal. And in this data portal, there are there's extensive documents to look at how other schools have, have uh, transitioned into establishing a bridge program. Uh, there's even slides to suggest how to do something like this. We made our own slides, but we could have used that, uh, those slides if we wanted. And uh, there's other, like I said, p professional development opportunities where bridge programs from all over the state and uh, even uh, other uh, New England states are coming together to talk about this important work. 
go for it, yeah. Hello? Okay. <laughs> All right, excellent. So um, just an overview of the Bridge Program. So the Bridge Program is a program established for students who are returning from an extended leave of school based um, from a medical or a mental health um, scenario that prevents them from coming to school. So um, these students we have found traditionally have been supported through um, home and hospital tutoring, which is a cost um, to our school and our district. And it also continues to take the student out of the school environment. So this program is set aside to help reintegrate the students back into the school environment as quickly as possible um, with our own people, with our own um, teachers still collaborating more directly with the students. So um, there are a couple of other elements. There's the academic coordinator that Mr. Bushy was uh, referring to as our teaching assistant, who is the person in charge of going and checking out all the teachers and the work that needs to be done for a particular student and coordinating that piece. There's also a clinical component to it. So we have clinical coordinator and um, th that role is supporting the skills needed for the reintegration of the student back into the school setting. And um, it's a very collaborative effort between the families and our bridge team. So it's a lot of communication, weekly communication. It's a lot of um, meetings and benchmarks so that we can make sure that we are making effective progress on the goals that we set aside both academically and clinically. All right, so <laughs> the four S's of bridge. Um, so student space, staffing, and services. So let me tell you a little bit more in detail what it looks like at Lawrence School. So the students, again, um, we have an eligible criteria that any student that's returning from a mental health or medical leave are able to uh, join the program. We are always looking at um, students who may also be um, missing school with an extended absence. Um, that could be more of an emotional situation um, and you know, just anything that's preventing them from being a regular student um, going to class to class um, or even attending school to begin with. Um, so that's kind of the lens of the students that we're seeing. Um, it's also a, a, a kind of a moving target of students because we also want to support all students in the program. So we're going to be taking a careful look at students as they enter the program because not all students can be the best mix to each other. Um, so we're going to have to be working to kind of prioritize and work through the individual characteristics of the students to make sure that it's a cohesive, um, positive group working together. Yes. <laughs> so the the space is is uh is it's an interesting room that's downstairs that at one point was the weight room and then it was the in school suspension room and then it was a case manager classroom. So it's had a lot of uh, different scenarios, but we we like it now for bridge and we've got a lot of work that we still have to do with it. Uh, but we have, uh, our, like I said, our, our academic coordinator has really taken the role seriously of making the room look more conducive to a therapeutic scenario. And you can see right now, we've got just some classroom desks and uh, you know, a conference table on the side. But you see Karen's taking some steps to put some nice posters up and we got some, looks like some flowers in there. Uh, we had some other items in the, in the room that we've moved out, the custodians have taken out to help it make, look more like a welcoming place for kids to come. Uh, we do have more plans to uh, get some more therapeutic items in there, which um, Lynette will be hearing about shortly. And uh, that those are, that Lynette is the mini grant uh, gatekeeper, as for those of you who don't know, she'll be hearing from us soon. But uh, we also have plans to arrange for a private meeting space in that in that workspace as well. So we have a lot of work to do, but we have already uh, made some significant moves and in, in other areas of the building to free up this space. So here's a graphic of our staffing. Um, you know, not only are we thankful to FEF for allowing us to have the outside partnership um, with Paul and Kate, um, 
but we're also very thankful to the Central Office Administration because um, we were able to secure an academic coordinator that is working with us um, directly in this program for the whole year. So this staffing model um, is something that we've been playing with for a really long time, um, but we were able to really hone in on that, and you can see that our clinical coordinators are um, divided by grade, and those are our school adjustment guidance counselors that are already staffed there. So this is a role that's gonna take them outside of their office again and be providing some clinical services in this bridge space. And then, um, it, Mr. Bushy and I are dividing and conquering the grades and um, being the administrator for each of the grades so that we can help with that care coordination directly with the families. And then if we need to, depending on the clientele that's coming in, um, we can involve our special education building administrator or our school psychologist um, as needed with the different populations that come through. Okay, so um, <laughs> with the services, again, um, we're providing that direct academic support. So there are students that may be in the classroom uh, that some assignments may be waived, may be looked at or modified, but the direct communication is with the teacher. So we're trying to keep that partnership with the teacher so that that student is still part of that team. It's still uh, on that teacher's caseload, but the academics may be happening in a, a different setting for a short uh, window of time. The clinical support, again, is um, a critical component of that as we're transitioning back into school. The families are also very welcoming of the support and trying to navigate how to you know, help their child reintegrate back into a school setting if they've been away on an extended leave. Um, and again, it's all about caring for our students and making sure that they get back into the classroom setting where they're most successful. And just to echo what Mrs. Vieira said before about our, you know, how grateful we are to the, uh, to the central office team for providing us the support of the, of the teaching assistant. The, uh, the model, like a, a, an ideal model, actually calls for an adjustment counselor, and we know that we were behind schedule and planning, and we had put together all these scenarios of how we could work within our current structure, and we we knew we could do it, but it wouldn't have been the best for the kids and I think it was Paul who uh, we had met multiple times in the summer and he called me one morning at a crazy hour saying I, I was up all night thinking about this and you need to go and advocate for at least getting a teaching assistant and just you know he gave me that push to, to do it and at that point we were we were courageous enough to 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 go and talk with Lori and uh, the other folks at, at central office and again we are supremely thankful for her ability to work with us on that I think just in summary, um, a piece that we didn't really mention is that this is a temporary, we're, we're looking at a window of time, roughly about eight to 12 weeks that we're working with these students in this program. And generally, you know, it could be a day by day or a week by week thing where we're trying to get them integrated one class at a time, uh, you know, every other day at a time. So it is a temporary thing that we're working with the students. And we just had our first intake meeting yesterday. So we, this is all, you know, kind of new to us still, but it's feeling really good. Um, with the family that we were working with. So we did our um, first entry meeting yesterday and it was really exciting, so. So I, I tried to summarize that quick. <laughs> Okay, we'll exit the kids out. They'll become alumni, and uh, they'll always know they have a place to come back and check in with us, and uh, we'll continue to communicate with the counselor, the academic coordinator, and the families, of course. What else is there? That's it. Thank you very much. So do you remember when you studied Shakespeare in school and learned how energetic and participatory theater was in Shakespeare's day? Liz Lyles at Lawrence wondered how to capture some of that energy and engagement for her students. Liz. Okay, I'll try. Hi, 
Hi, um, I'm actually representing the whole eighth grade uh, English department, so I'm here on behalf of myself, but also Carolyn Alves, um, Janet Marshall, and Lynn Sharetta. Um, so we worked as a whole department on this, um, and yeah, I think Ellen may have given us a pretty good intro here. Um, the this, this is the background. Um, about seven-ish years ago, we decided we wanted to add Shakespeare as a core curriculum text into the eighth grade. Um, and we had uh, some pushback, <laughs> um, mostly from parents. Uh, this was like very typical of the meet your teacher night. Um, and it was a little discouraging. And we kind of, we were planning to do Shakespeare in the spring. And so we thought like, okay, what can we do ahead of time to try to erase these connotations that the students are coming in with. They're coming in with a block about Shakespeare, and it's not coming from them, it's coming from what they hear people saying. Um, so we did some research, and we, um, we reached out to FEF uh, to help us bring Shakespeare and Company into the classroom, uh, into the school. So um, it would have been prohibitive to bring the kids there, but they have an education touring component. Um, and so with uh, FEF's support, uh, Shakespeare and Company, which is an internationally recognized Shakespeare troupe in Lenox, Massachusetts, send um, eight or nine actors to us. Um, and so we had three goals. We wanted to uh, develop familiarity, break that block down. We wanted to build our sort of comfort as teachers also, learn from these actors on how we could bring that performance aspect into the classroom and really give the kids a lot of um, familiarity with the skills that you need in order to do Shakespeare. So um, so th what FEF helped us do is this is a picture here of the um, actors themselves. They do a 45 minute presentation for the entire eighth grade, so that's 250, 300 students, um, on Shakespeare's life and legacy and sort of history. The social studies teachers love it because it fits right into their curriculum about the Renaissance. Um, and you can see from the picture, like it. There's no fancy sets, there's no fancy costumes. These are modern people in modern clothes with like some chairs <laughs> performing and, and the kids get it and they get Shakespeare and that I think that's their first step in realizing like, oh, okay, this isn't that scary actually and some of it's kind of funny and there's fighting and that's great. Um, and then we get six workshops with the Shakespeare and Company actors. So we split our kids into groups of 40 um, and they do, this is a, a warm up, this is one of the actors, um, and they do these really fun, really imaginative, creative warm ups with the kids where they get a sense of like, what does it mean to be an actor? How do you use your body? How do you use your voice? Um, and it's phenomenal. Those kids who cannot stay in their seat, they're your biggest behavior problem in the classroom, this is like their moment to shine. They will act like a monkey and they will crawl like a kitten and they will like, you know, come up with catchphrases that they shout at each other and they do phenomenally. Um, and then the actors split them even further down and so you get eight kids working with one of the actors on one scene, one very, very short scene from Shakespeare the actors talk them through how do you analyze the text, how do you translate that into body language, and then how do you present that to your classmates so that they understand what you're saying without the text in front of them. And this has been, these two pieces have been the most useful for us as teachers because we've been able to sort of um, steal these ideas and use them in the classroom so that we, we try really hard to put this um, performance at the beginning of our unit so that it's a great intro for the kids and then we build on it in the classroom. Um, so, we've been, with FEF's incredible support, we've been doing this every single year. We realized that if, um, if Shakespeare and Company was gonna come once, we really needed them to come every year, and that's way beyond what um, we could budget for as a department, but FEF has given us this incredible continuing grant, which allows us to bring the actors back every year, and we've been building the unit. Um, every year it's gotten bigger and bigger. So now, rather than just familiarity, we want the kids to really take ownership of Shakespeare, and I'll, I'll show you an example of that in a second. Um, rather than just having uh, rigorous text analysis, we're trying to build the creativity into that text analysis. Um, and then finally, and this is the piece that we're excited to keep developing, um, we want to start building connections with the community. We know there's lots of great actors and lots of really um, Shakespeare-y people, right, who love people who love Shakespeare in our community, and we want to start bringing them into the school and, and letting what the kids are doing be visible to them also. So. Uh, here's some examples of things we've been able to build. We now have the kids create Midsummer Night's Dream games. These have to be text-based, so you can see this is a Monopoly board, but each scene is one of the squares, so you have to buy the scenes. 
Um, there's a family feud game where they like face off questions about the text. Um, this was a light, you know, like game life where you like spin the dial and the people, yeah, but you had to start as either a mechanical or a noble, which are the two classes, social classes in Midsummer Night's Dream. There was a guess who where you didn't get a picture, you just had the character's name, so you had to understand what the character was doing in the play in order to guess who the other person had. The kids had so much fun making these, and they had, I think, even more fun trying to stump their classmates and trying, so they had these tables and they could rotate and play each other's games, and it was, it was really, really fun. Um, we also uh, developed a prompt that asked the kids to compare Shakespeare, in particular Shakespeare's use of archetypes, to a modern story or multiple stories. Um, so two text comparison, which is exactly what our standardized testing is asking us to prepare the kids for. Um, but you can see from these sample thesis statements that they uh, have a lot of fun with this. And what I love about it is it shows they're not afraid to analyze Shakespeare at this point. They are totally willing to compare it to Shrek or West Side Story. You get a lot of South Park, but I didn't put that one up here. Um, because they're realizing that these archetypes and these stereotypes were true in Shakespeare's time and are true today. And so by studying Shakespeare, they're getting um, that opportunity to also discuss their pop culture and the stories that are important to them, which has been really wonderful to see the kids uh, really enjoy doing. Um, and then finally, so this is from several years ago. It's the, um, these pictures are from several years ago. We started having the kids choose a favorite scene and perform it for their classmates with a really basic rubric about, you know, are you body language and vocal performance and, you know, did you work together or not? Um, and once we started doing this, we realized that what the kids were doing in the workshops was better than what they were doing in the classroom, and that we could open it up to them. They really wanted a chance to have more ownership over it. Um, and so, I don't know if I got, yeah, so <laughs> we started a competition that we called a Shakes Off, um, and each, uh, eighth grade teams can send up to 10 competitors. They are then split into cross team groups so they don't know who they're gonna be working with. They are randomly assigned a one page scene. They're given about an hour to work on it, um, including, as you can see, picking costumes and sort of themes and finding a way to interpret it, um, and then presenting, and then a panel of judges who are not us. Uh, so science teachers have been doing it and uh, previous winners from the high school have done it, um, and some community members, librarians, um, and they grade the, or sort of judge the students based on vocal performance and text analysis and creativity and working together. Um, and then the winners get you know, candy, but that's what anybody wants, so that's great. <laughs> um, and we, so we tried this out for the first time as like a real thing last year, and it was phenomenally successful for the kids involved. What we're working on building now is we think we can use this to build that community connection piece. Um, we're having, we wanted to have the parents come, but then they can't come during the day, but if it's at night, then the kids can't always participate because they can't get back to school. So we've got a lot of logistics to work out, but we're really excited about this possibility. This was um, really fun. And so it was built off of um, what I'm gonna, do I have a couple of minutes for the video? Excellent, perfect. Um, so I have a video to show you of what gave me this idea. A couple of years ago, um, a couple, uh, a one in particular, one class of kids said like, no, we wanna, we wanna do scenes, but we wanna do them outside because it's supposed to be in the woods and we wanna do costumes and we wanna interpret them. Um, so there was like, you know, we should have the lovers fight scene, but it's the Kardashians. And we should have Pyramus and Thisbe, but it's, in the Pyramus and Thisbe scene, there's a wall and it's getting increasingly hard to keep presidential impersonations out of the classroom, but, so I'm not gonna show you that one, don't worry, but that happened a lot last year. Um, so two things, oh, oh, so real quickly, they're no longer scared of Shakespeare. Um, there's this great, I went into Steve's Pizza a couple of years ago on a Thursday night and the freshman football team was there and with all apologies to the ninth grade English teachers in the classroom. Um, they, one of them came, one of the football players came up to me and said, Miss Lyles, I'm not having none of this odyssey. I wanna know when we gonna read Shakespeare, man. Like, <laughs> you can't make that up. That's, that's real, I, would, I couldn't invent that if I wanted to. So, um, the, it's a little bit, oh no, that's sad. I'll request access, but it's my video, so I don't know how else I'm gonna get to it. Um, yeah, really quickly, I'll just, I'll just say, it, so they put together like a trailer, like Midsummer Night's Dream, coming to a theater near you, and they had little clips of them. They filmed it on their cameras, so their phones, so it was a little grainy, um, but you could kind of see there was a nerd-themed one, and there was an animals one, and there, there was a, um, 
Oberon versus Titania, hip hop versus ballet themed one. So they really are getting this, this ownership piece that we want and now we can really start to build in um, uh, how do like how can we as teachers help them with it in the classroom, right? How can we build the text analysis and the rigorous discussion? Um, so with FEF's continuing grant, which has been phenomenal for us, we're bringing the Shakespeare Company back every year, um, but we as teachers in the classroom are building it more and more and more um, so that hopefully it's something that the kids start talking about in a positive way, like, oh, I'm in eighth grade, I get to do Shakespeare this year, <laughs> which would be really great. So thank you, and thank you very much to FEF. Thank you. I, I, it's, it's striking to me how um, not only excited these teachers are, educators are about what they're doing, how much they care about the kids that they're working with, but also the, um, the degree of reflection. How can we make it better? How can we tweak it? How can we improve it? What does it mean if it didn't go the way we wanted it? That's what FEF loves, that um, degree of um, analysis and creativity. East Falmouth Elementary's Elijah Switzer asked some important questions. What does a 21st century classroom look and sound like? How can technology and other things be effective tools in creating that kind of environment? So welcome, Elijah. I should have the technology thing down, I guess. Uh, so I got to start with the story, which is that I was really excited finishing my undergrad. I had my degree in elementary education. I got my first job in my hometown. And I walk into this classroom, and it's pretty empty. And there are a few desks. And then there's this great big closet. And Dr. Dale, who's the principal at East Thomas, shows me to the room. And I'm like, this is awesome. And by the way, it was August 1st. And she had to keep me out of there until August 1st, because I kept begging to get in the room. And I open the closet, and a lot of trash falls out. <laughs> and uh, I just thought to myself, I, was, I said, I, I can improve this environment. And so for pretty much the whole first year, uh, where I didn't have the materials I felt like I needed to really um, physically meet the needs and engage my students. I actually, I don't know if Justine's here, I, I don't know if you remember, I, I kind of pushed all the desks to the side. And I remember in my evaluation, uh, Dr. Dale wrote, he prefers to teach using the carpet. <laughs> and that was true, because I really just wanted to build community and collaborate with the kids. And so, uh, to me, it just seemed counterproductive to have the kids sit at desks and face me while I stood up there and talked to them. Keep in mind, they're eight and nine years old. So, um, oh yeah, so uh, when Tracy Bushy emailed me and asked me to present, she said, you know, your question is what does the 21st century classroom look like? So as if you're eight years old, I'm not gonna stand here and talk to you, so I'm gonna show you four videos about what the classroom looks like. Uh, all right. Can I, there, is this, oh, I got a mouse here, all right, great. Is there going to be sound here, Ryan? OK, we'll try it. Oh. I need some sounds. Maybe. Yeah, keep turning that up. Yeah. All right, well, that's all right. We, uh, we'll need a sound for a couple of them, but this one we don't need sound. Uh, so just check this video out, and I'll talk about it after.
All right, so that student right there is working on a, a Math Facts Fluency app, and uh, he really, really, really does dislikes math. So in, in that case, I, I just use the board and engagement, and he loves the fact that he's the person who gets to do it on the board every day. And as you can see, it's much bigger than him. And as you can see, he wasn't going to stay in his seat. So uh, there's a couple more. Oh, and also, I love this video because there's this other student here. And if you notice, she's completely plugged into her computer. He is not bothering her one bit. So uh, this one I unfortunately need audio for. So we'll see if Can we you get it. explain what you did to make it better? Can you hear it? If it doesn't spin, it's not going to create as much what? Um, acceleration. Okay, so you figured out a way to give it more acceleration, create more acceleration, and gave it more mass. Okay, go ahead and roll it. Awesome, you did so much better than last time. You notice there are a lack of worksheets and a great big space, and just keep that in mind as we go forward here. I don't know. I'm just going to keep, I'm just going to skip it because I'm, I'm running a long time anyway. All right. So, uh, yeah, so I really wanted you to see those two videos to kind of just get the sense it's a really big open space. And to me, the classroom is for the students. So also, you won't see a teacher's desk in my room because uh, that would imply that it's my space. And it's really not for me. Uh, I'm going to give you a moment to read this because you're not eight and I don't feel the need to read to you. But that's kind of my goal when I think about education as a whole. So there's a, there's a few things that I'm trying to get at. And uh, I just I think of it a lot when I uh, teach my writing. Uh, we just kind of have this open idea right now. The district really, I think, is working hard to develop um, elementary school writing. But we're at a, we have a freedom to teach the way we want. And I really try and teach it in a practical manner. And I kind of think to myself a lot. And this is kind of what the whole classroom is based on. And this is just an example. But essentially, I don't know how many of you sat down over the last three weeks, used graphic organizers, and wrote a personal narrative about a winter wonderland, because I definitely haven't. So I do daily journal writing with prompts, and I try to think about the fact that most of my kids are going to spend their lives writing emails. Uh, and so it's just how can we communicate through words. And so that's kind of the real, real world application that I'm trying to get at. Uh, and then we do a lot of problem solving strategies, and uh, I try to make everything practical and relatable. So this is a great picture of the environment. What you're going to see here is uh, I took a panoramic of my classroom. This was last week. And you see a bunch of different kids working uh, really on different settings. There are a couple of students over here who are standing up at uh, stand-up desks. And then a few students uh, working together at a table. There's a student at a table by herself. A couple of students at regular desks. And essentially, there are no, no student has an assigned desk, and this is really where um, I'm thankful for the FEF, and I needed them to come in and really support me to get a lot of these materials, like the stand-up desks. And uh, this is the clear touch panel, which I'm going to talk about uh, in a little bit. But essentially, at this point, FEF has supported me in three different grants that total about, I think, about $10,000. Um, with the panel being uh, a lot of that. And then there's also these crates here, which you'll see, and those serve a lot of different purposes. And uh, I made the tops, but again, uh, I wouldn't have been able to buy the supplies without the FEF. So the whole idea is just to maximize space for students, and it's their, uh, their classroom. It's really all about choice. Uh, one of the most common arguments I hear when people who might have questions come into my room, they say, Things like, oh, those wobble stools, I didn't need that uh, as a child. Like, you know, my, uh, my dad sat in a desk and he did great. And my, uh, my kid sat at a desk and he did great. And I thought to them, well, what about the kid that wasn't in your room who didn't do great? You know, and we're all just different. And in so many aspects of our lives, we understand that people are not, you know, we, we all have different needs. And I feel like a lot of times in classrooms, that's falling behind. So. The students try out all these spaces where they sit or work, who they sit and work with, and then I interview them and really talk to them 
about what they like, what they dislike, who they work with, who they don't work with. And there's a whole system. And about 90 days into the year, I get to the point where the students come in and they can sit wherever they want, which really teaches them they have to be responsible for their own learning and essentially who they associate with. I think too often we get frustrated with students when they're older, that they get in arguments with other kids, but their entire lives we've been telling them who to be with, who to sit with in class. So I'm, and we've all worked with challenging people and worked with people really enjoy. So I'm trying to get at that a lot. Uh, this, is, uh, this is the technology piece. I try to incorporate as much uh, you know, modern technology as I can into the classroom. And one of the things I really try to tell, share with the students is that I just don't know what the technology is going to be like when they graduate high school in what for my students now is, believe it or not, 2028. Right? And so I think that's a really important piece that sometimes we miss on in schools is the fact that this is not the technology that they're going to be dealing with when they're in college, you know, when they uh, start careers. And so I teach them Google Slides, but I try and encourage them to understand, like, I didn't have Google Slides and this is going to change. But if you're staying current, you will be on the cutting edge and be able to, uh, you know, and you're going to be ahead of everybody else in what you do. And the clear touch panel, which you see featured here, when we bought that, thanks to FEF, that had only been released, I, I think, so it showed up in September, and that came out uh, in December. So, thanks. So, uh, that was only the, the, the piece of technology, and it's a board, like, I don't even, it's 65 inches maybe, and it has 15 points of touch, so 15 kids can touch it. There's tons of games you can play on it. If I plan well enough on the board, as I have here with these two uh, students, they're collaborating. I think we were reading Island of the Blue Dolphins or BFG. Uh, that's actually my knee, and I'm sitting back. I, I had planned well enough on the board and created this map, and the girls created an entire story map. Uh, on their own, and you can see one student's referencing the book, but she's got the pen in her hand. And then, uh, Joanne, I think you were here this day. I think you took that picture. And uh, Joanne uh, made a comment to me afterwards. I think it was true. There was actually about a 10-minute period in that lesson where I didn't say anything or do anything. The students all worked together and uh, created a character map for, I believe it was um, Winnie and Tuck Everlasting. And so that kind of plays right into the collaboration piece, which is I just have the kids collaborate with each other as much as possible. They go home. Unfortunately, like it's sad how many of my kids go home and sit on and look at screens. And one comment that's always been made to me about myself is people say to me, oh, you're going to be successful because you can talk to people. And I guess I always took that for granted, but I try to encourage my students to talk to each other. So you see us doing a bunch of different activities. Again, you're not seeing any worksheets. You're seeing skills that they're building, which is really just to communicate with each other and, and get along. Uh, and so they taking responsibility for your actions. I talk a lot about working smart. I think that's a really important thing. We tell our kids to work hard, and the hard work is going to pay off, and it's going to get them somewhere. And I think we can all agree that's just not that true. You do need to put an effort and work hard, but you have to think intelligently. So I talk a lot about efficiency, and we use technology a lot for that. Uh, learn who to associate with. I talked about that. OK, this is a big piece. And uh, the FEF helped me create this space was really important. Uh, executive functioning is a huge issue. I don't know if any of you had a an old school teacher who, you know, the desk was messy and they took the desk and dumped it out on the floor. I don't know if that happened to me, but I think it happened to the kid next to me, and I kind of was like, oh gosh, I hope that doesn't happen to me. But I had, we, I remember being in school and we never really learned how to organize things. I would never expect a kid to do multiplication without being able, without teaching him multiplication strategies first. And somehow a lot of teachers or just people in general, we expect these kids to be organized and be able to can't take out steps and we haven't explicitly taught it to them. So what you'll see here is all communal supplies. You'll see the room is pretty much empty except for the specific items that we're using at the time. And then we write lists out almost before every lesson and the students have to then go and understand and project, okay, if I need to complete this ta uh, task A, I need these five supplies. They have to get it and bring it back to their seats. And I think that's very dependent on them not having the desks in front of them. And they can't get messy. So we keep some stuff in our crates. And every year I'm kind of tweaking it and doing something different. I've done crates with tops. I've done crates without tops. I've done just communal supplies. This is a picture from last year. They had to get everything out of the um, shelves. Uh, we do a lot with uh, understanding your study habits. Am I done? <laughs> you can no, no, no. It's 
cool. That's cool. Uh, all right, no, that's cool. I think I'm good. Uh, I think this is the last thing I really need to hit on, which is that it just creates a lot of natural movement. And uh, movement is just so important for our kids. I just don't expect any of the kids to sit at their desk for that long. I don't know. I know you're not watching me, but if you notice me sitting at the, like, I'm leaning over, I'm moving all the time, and it's hard for me to sit and focus. So I definitely don't expect that from an eight-year-old. So we get up and change activities all the time, but also with the communal supplies, the kids have to get up to get their stuff. And if you came into my room, you might think it's somewhat chaotic, but it's very controlled chaos because they need to get their materials, and, and that, that builds right into our, um, our learning. And I, and I don't have to tell the kid to go take a lap or something. We do that too, but um, it's really built in. So um, yeah, so I, just, I guess I just got to give a shout out to the FEF because they really helped me build this vision um, of a room that's really best for my students' physical needs. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> One of the wonderful things FEF can offer through its grants is the opportunity for direct experience with places and people and artifacts that make learning so immediate and meaningful. Lauren Kenny and Heather Goodwin from Falmouth High School wondered how trips to museums could impact student learning. Lauren and Heather. I'm the Heather Goodwin part of the Lauren and Heather. Um, I started teaching AP Biology about five years ago. I took over from my department head, Chris Brothers, who had done it for a long time. And one of her suggestions, or one of the things that she always did with her students was bring them to the Harvard Museum of Natural History. And that seemed like a great idea, something I would want to do. But starting to teach the, a new course, and especially at the AP level, that occupied a lot of my time, <laughs> rather than trying to figure out how to do a field trip. So I eased my way into the whole idea, and especially applying for grants. I did a mini grant with Your Inner Fish, which is a book written by Neil Shubin all about our evolution, human evolution, how we came from fish to where we are. Um, and then I decided last year, the year before, that it was time, I was confident with the material, it's time for me to step up and do the field trip to Cambridge, to the museum. Which, again, I thought the only way I'm going to be able to do this is going to be with some help from the FEF, because I wanted to, especially after talking to other teachers who went to Boston, Lauren Kenny, Jane Baker, you want the comfortable bus for the trip up there, because you need the bathroom just in case you get stuck in traffic or the bus breaks down. Um, you want that comfort. And number two, I wanted to be able to do a classroom experience while we were there, not just go up and observe the museum, but actually give them the opportunity to participate in one of the classroom experiences. So, let me, there we go. So this is us getting, actually this was after we had just gone through the museum, but either I was getting ready to send them off to go to Harvard Square for lunch. And you can see we all, I printed out a bunch of maps for them because I was really nervous about sending all of us off into Harvard Square, myself included because I'm not really comfortable up there and I had never done it before. So either way, I had some apps. Um, but one of the big topics in the AP Biology curriculum that follows us through all of our big ideas, we have four big ideas, but one of the big themes is evolution. So that's why I felt it was important for, all, for me to bring 20 odd kids, 21, up to the museum to have the experience of actually seeing some evolution in action, some fossils, some pictures of Darwin, um, some information behind everything that they were learning about. And also in your inner fish, the whole reason what Neil Shubin was famous for was discovering these fossils called Tiktaalik. And when I went up to the museum, because I went up before I brought all of them just to have some idea what I was getting myself into, right when you walk in is this sculpture of Tiktaalik. So of course, after the FEF funding from Your Inner Fish, and then be able to connect now the project of our field trip and also the book, it just 
I was blown away. I was excited. Um, I don't, I'm hoping, I think the students were too. Um, when we got up there, I sent them on a selfie scavenger hunt just because we weren't sure with traffic wise how long it was going to take to get there. We had a classroom visit set up for 1030. We actually ended up getting there at 930, so it worked out really well. So the kids were sent off with a list of 27 items, which again, I had gone through and prepared before I had gone up there. Sent them on their way. And so here's one with Darwin, a little background on him. And then this is my, this is Tiktaalik here that Anil Shubin writes about. So again, I was very excited to see that model just because it does mean so much to us in our history of our evolution, of human evolution. And then again, a little of the, Ancestor, I won't bore you with evolution stuff, but um, I could be here all afternoon. So then we went and made our way to a classroom discussion, which gave a really nice overview. We hadn't started evolution yet at this point, so this was just kind of a nice way for them to get some of the cobwebs out. Again, they had freshman biology two years before, but still, by participating in this activity, they were looking at some common ancestry stuff, um, the history of evolution. Two minutes, okay. Evolution of dogs, et cetera. Okay, so, and again, we got to touch some, I think that was a frog, I think. Uh, and again, some other pictures while we were waiting there. Okay, so once they went to the museum, the second part of their project was now creating an activity for the science fair, the Falmouth Science Fair, the first weekend in March. So the students were told that they had to design a science fair project or an activity for younger kids based off of something that they saw at the museum. And most of, we've done this in the past before, I've done this in the past where they've created a lesson plan and I usually just open it up to all of biology, but this time I was specific and said it had to be something based off of what we saw at the museum. Now the unfortunate side of all of this is I don't know if the rest of you remember, but I do. The first weekend in March was the Friday night when we lost power, had a huge storm. Um, my basement flooded. I didn't sleep well. So my pictures for the science fair side are kind of lacking. And I had to, Chris Brothers took these because I think I was awake somewhat for this, but not very much. But either way, the students did a great job of coming up with some good projects um, in regards to what they saw at the museum. And, I have always loved what the kids come up with for the science fair because it's the older students, AP, big high schoolers, now talking to some of the younger kids in our community. So it really, and again, they are the ones instructing. I just step back and watch them teach the younger kids about, in this case it was regarding natural selection. Uh, I just pulled up, this was what the students came up with for their little description, but I also really like this one too because they based their projects and their character cards off of what they saw at the museum. So it really did have a direct connection. And then, sorry, I'll go through. And then another one was digging for fossils. And again, they had to come up with the objectives, have the instructions for the younger kids. And um, this is actually Lauren's daughter and mine playing the games. Uh, it's great because ha we have younger kids that can actually help me out with the evaluation process too. Uh, <laughs> But I mean, again, having the opportunity to go to Boston, the kids love the freedom to be able to go up there to explore Harvard Square, even though it was for a short amount of time. So I'm very thankful to FEF for providing us this comfy bus for the ride up and then the trip to the museum too. All right, I'm Lauren Kenny. I also teach at Falmouth High School. Excuse me, I've had a cold. Um, we also go to Boston with AP Lit. I teach freshman uh, English and AP Lit and science fiction as well. Um, and this is going to be my third year doing ECFRSIS. Uh, the first year I did it at the MFA. And last year we went to the Gardner. My first time going, gorgeous. Um, There we go, okay. Uh, what is ekphrasis? Because this is always the first question I get. It's an ancient Greek form of literature. Is poetry based on art? So I started with an example from Elizabeth Barrett Browning based on Hiram Powers' Greek slave. I don't wanna take time to watch, just to show you. This is where I showed kids um, as a model, an exemplar. Uh, thank you to the FEF. We were able to go into the Gardner. We participated, I'll get into it in a minute, in visual thinking strategies, which is a deep analysis of art. Um, the transportation, and we had journals as well that the FEF provided. 
why I chose this project, AP Lit is obviously very heavy in the study of poetry. I love poetry, I love art, I love working with Jane Baker, I've been doing it since I took over AP Lit a few years ago. Uh, so it's an opportunity, and I love creative writing, and we don't have, unfortunately, I think at, at that level, enough opportunity for creative writing. And I think for them really to appreciate it, they need to do it. Uh, the study of poetry, as I said, I love the study of art. Um, we bond the AP art and the AP lit kids. You know, for a few years there, I guess there was kind of this connotation of AP art isn't a real AP. Well, the AP lit kids had to create art and the AP art kids had to create literature. So it was a healthy bonding experience as well. Um, the intimate relationship with the art is the reason to go to the museum. I think as Elijah was saying, you know, it's so easy for them to pull up something on their phone or that instant gratification or access. I can send them to the MFA website and they can look at any piece of art that they want or to the Gardner Museum website. But I think in order to create this intimate poem, they need that relationship, that time with the art. And so that, as you'll see in a few pictures in a minute, they definitely had. Also, the presentations, I've put three of their presentations in here. I'd love for them to give them to you, but they're all at college now. Um, so I just threw three, uh, three really good ones in there um, to show you what they did. But the process, as I told them when they got to the museum, they had to choose their piece that they spoke, that spoke to them. They had, in the presentation, they identify the artist and all the art information, um, the piece information. They wrote a stream of consciousness response. So the journals the FEF provided, they're journaling, very freehand, very informal. Um, then they're going to write a detailed description of the art so that someone who couldn't visualize it could. And then they finally ended with their poem. So here's the experience. Visual thinking strategies, I was not privy to until Jane had introduced me to it. It's really, you know, in lit, we encourage this deep analysis of literature. What is a writer doing and how do they do that? Well, these lovely ladies at the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum also did the same with art. So another form, this visual art analysis that our kids, um, I mean, we get when I do Romeo and Juliet, thanks Liz, by the way, freshman year, I put images, for, you know, famous um, images inspired by Romeo and Juliet up on the board, but it's not nothing like this and seeing the art on the wall. And these ladies are trained, it was ladies because that's, that's who um, took our group around, are trained in how to encourage this deeper analysis of art. Um, again, the, as you can see here, they're picking their piece. They're doing their stream of consciousness. Jane is giving them art information, <laughs> her expertise. Um, there's Tom with some, I mean, it's just a, it was the first time I've ever been. I love this one of, I mean, she was obviously studying whatever she chose to write about. Uh, we ran into some former FEF grads while we were up there, told them that we were doing this project. They said, hey, we'll meet you. Um, so here are the products. So I chose three, Natalie, Paige, and Ben. Um, three very different ones, and I won't. I'll try to go through them kind of quickly. Um, so as you can see, generally, I want them to do the description before they put the art up there, um, but they you know, are analyzing what's in the piece. Uh, there's the information on the piece. And I love that they're doing this in the presentations. They're really breaking down what they saw in their stream of consciousness and providing that to us, um, which I think is gorgeous. And then uh, I should add that we had a formal reception in the spring, or after the, after the trip. And then we have, if you want to take a, a minute to read, I think this is Natalie's. How are we doing on time? Okay. Um, I have about a minute. So uh, then you have Paige who chose a very different piece. Again, she does her um, description of the piece. This is the piece and its information. Um, I, I just love the way that she did this. It's a very striking presentation. I wish she was here to give it to you. She really broke down what she saw in the piece. Again, I don't think she would have gotten this had she viewed it on a screen. Just a really, as you can tell here, an intimate experience with the art. And even a description of where it was and how it was placed. If you know the gardener, I learned this in going there, everything is purposeful in the placement and what is around it. 
and she acknowledged that in, in her study of the piece and through the VTS, um, the women gave us that information. I, I just have one more. I know you want to read the poem, but I'm running out of time. Um, it's okay. This is Ben's. I chose, I chose Ben's because it's hilarious. So, you know, you have your serious student. And Ben wrote two poems, so he wouldn't come off as a total joke. He goes, I had to do something funny with this. You'll see why this image he chose in a second. So he wrote a serious one. Um, you got to see his stream of consciousness. It's hilarious. Uh, he forgets to train his calves. Um, the table is made by a quality carpenter. Too bad it's covered with a tablecloth. I'll ignore the fact that he's got a, um, a spelling error there. Um, and he goes on. <laughs> Dainty hands. Um, subtle bling. I mean, he was just hilarious. Jane, I don't know if you remember this, but this was a hilarious presentation. Um, baby face, extravagant but simple collar. It's, it's pretty funny. Um, but obviously this piece spoke to him. A piece spoke to him. Um, so he wrote two poems, again, going above and beyond in Apulet. Uh, he wrote uh, one that was serious and one that was um, more for fun. Um, but again, we want to thank the FEF. Are you reading it? <laughs> and as you're reading, they did. They delivered this, um, these to the AP Art and AP Lit Kids. We did it in the library. We had snacks and tea. It was like a formal reception. It was really beautiful um, and a beautiful way to close this out. So I'm really excited to go back to the Gardener again this year. I, I don't know. I mean, they, they're beautiful writers. But again, especially with pages in the middle with Christ and the cross, um, I think that that just, again, you can, you can feel how she felt when she saw that piece. So uh, that's the end of Ben's <laughs> He was drawn to these men. <laughs> um, so thank you again, the FEF, uh, for this wonderful experience. We all appreciated it. So I'm reminded by these wonderful presentations that one important guideline for us in FEF is that we always say we don't fund stuff, we fund projects. We're not interested in, you know, um, buying a piece of equipment because mm, it would be fun to have it, or taking kids on a field trip because why not? It's the, the the funding that we do is built around projects that are that have depth and breadth, um, that have goals and assessments. Um, teachers are intentional and purposeful about what they're doing, and I think you can hear that in the in the presentations. So, FEF and Bob Porto go way back, probably to 2010 or 2011, when there was a, um, an Enterprise article about an ambitious plan at Lawrence School to transform an old wood shop into an engineering lab, a STEM lab. Budget-wise, it was going to be a gradual process. And then a couple of donors who'd read the article stepped up and said, this is good for kids. Let's give it a kickstart and get it going. And it's been going and evolving ever since, with Bob always asking how to make engineering fun, how to go deeper with kids. So, Bob. If this will work, I have a couple of facts that I'd like to play in, because honestly, you know, if I'm not having fun, the kids are going to be able to tell. So we need to make it Thanks. We need to make it fun for them as well. So if you'll bear with me for just a second, I know if I try to multitask and talk while I'm doing this, it's going to take twice as long. Um, so if you'll bear with me while I plug in. Any luck? Ah, there we go. All right, beautiful. Okay, so um, first of all, I'll start off by saying I love my job. Um, 
it's a lot of fun. We have a lot of fun with what we do. And again, I try to engage the students in what we're doing. I started 10 years ago as a science teacher. Uh, at that point, the wood shop was being used to store the town's voting booths, among other old equipment. Um, thanks to FEF, we were able to uh, really move it forward. In my first year, I had one drill uh, for 100 students at a time to use. Uh, thanks to FEF, we were able to do so much more, both in materials and getting tools that were appropriate to the students, the students' needs. The students did the dexterity of a 13-year-old you know, holding a power drill or using a jigsaw. We tried to find the right tools for that, and FEF helped make that possible. We had a pretty set curriculum to begin with, and as time went on, um, we started trying to develop some additional projects. So just a little quick background into um, you know, what we do. I'll, I'll show you some pictures. We, I began the program in uh, 2010. The seventh grade component was uh, added in 2012. Uh, which my wife teaches. I always joke, I saw more of my wife. We have adjoining classrooms. I saw more of my wife when we worked in separate buildings than I do now that we have adjoining classrooms. But we have a lot of fun with what we do. We try to engage the students, get their hands on tools, get them thinking about problem solving. Some of them come with experience from their families using tools before. Um, some of them have never used a tool in their life and it's a great introduction. I always say to them, my goal is not to necessarily make you all engineers, but to expose you to the options so that when you go on, you might find this is a great interest or sometimes equally important, you might find this is not at all what I want to do, but at least you know, you've given it a try. Um, and generally feedback we get from students over the course of the two years is pretty positive. So as time went on, uh, we were in our second or third year of the engineering program, and um, we were in a team meeting with Liz Lyles uh, one, one day, and she mentioned, I want to do this project on the Iditarod, uh, which is a sled dog race up in Alaska. And somebody, and Liz, I don't know, I don't remember exactly who it was, but somebody on the team said, what if the kids built sleds and raced them around the school? And my gut reaction was, of course, you know, being open-minded teacher that I am, no way we could do that. I don't have time for that. I already have a curriculum. And then about a second and a half later, I was like, wait a minute. We could build sleds, have the kids chase each other around the building. Yeah, let's give it a try. Um, so this is one of the projects that we've been able to fund. Again, I've, I've given you a little bit of background already. Um, this year's grant, uh, rather last year's grant, was to help further these programs. It began with the Iditarod, and I'll show you a few, uh, a few video clips along the way. Um, it began with the Iditarod, and then we began to uh, introduce additional projects. And through the FEF grant that I received last year, we've really been able to expand these, make them projects safer, more enjoyable for the kids. And I'll show you how in just a moment. FEF has been very good to us. We couldn't do what we do. So the Iditarod project came out. We started it in 2012. It was a small affair. It now involves multiple schools. Uh, FEF has been very good in funding it in a number of different ways. Uh, it connects with the English and math classes. They study and research and write to different mushers up in Alaska. We follow it in real time on the Iditarod website so students can see where their musher is along the course in March while they run the actual race up in Alaska. And a week later, we hold ours on the last day of the trimester. We invite students from the elementary schools to help us build the sleds, as well as uh, students from Morse Pond to come and cheer on the event. And as we've been developing, working with more technology, uh, we've been able to make, have the kids make some video blogs to share with the kids. What I'd like to do is show you a quick clip of the Iditarod in action here. I grew up in the 80s. I love Back to the Future. Part of the game is that uh, students are designed, we design a logo every year and have it printed up on t-shirts for all the students to wear. We also invite Iditarider staff members, there's Mr. Bush, I believe, right there. He retires last year's sled before the official event begins. Uh, we have teachers ride the sled at a ceremonial parade at the very beginning. Students have to design their own team flags. We make and measure checkpoints depending on each year's race. Um, as to where the spots are. And then each group, each class period I have, builds one or two sleds. They elect a student to be the dog, uh, lead dog, a student to be the musher to ride the sled, uh, as well as four or five other dogs to pull the sled. And whichever team does the race in the fastest time ends up winning. It's also a nice tradition. We invite last year's winning team back each year to pass the trophy along. And every year we've been successful in having students come back from the high school and pass the trophy along. So that's the Iditarod. And we did this for, uh, for a year or two. And then I work with another team in the spring. And on Monday, they had all, you know, Friday afternoon, they had all gone out to watch the Iditarod in front of the building. And then I'd get my new group on Monday and they'd say, so what do we get to do? And I'd say, 
I don't have a project for you guys. We're just going to do the regular old thing. And I thought that that was not really an acceptable answer. So I worked with the team I worked with in the spring, and we developed this program called the Da Vinci Dash. Uh, it ties in with the history when they're studying Da Vinci. It ties in with the science in when they're studying forces of motion at the end of the school year. And we came up with this absolutely chaotic Olympic event um, that some of you uh, I appreciate attended in the spring. Uh, students design uh, some kinetic carts that have to have a number of components to pull themselves up hills, steer in a bobsled race, race it downhill. They have to have a gear to plug in to raise a flag, their team's flag. They shoot hoops to test Newton's third law of motion so that as they shoot, their cart stretches back. Um, and we test action, reaction. They launch water balloons because it's June and everybody loves water balloons at the, in the last few weeks of school to try to knock down a castle wall and so on. So the Da Vinci Dash is a similar culminating project that we run at the very end of the year. So I'd like to show you guys a video of that. Uh, and we'll come to Rubin last. There we go. We began this the following year, uh, so we've run the um, Da Vinci Dash six times, we've run the Iditarod seven times. And it's very nice for me to have it be a yearly event. Students that come back and say, oh, you know, I remember my brother, my sister took part in this event, or my brother did the Iditarod, I get to do the, the Da Vinci Dash. So we have, uh, we have races around where they have to pull each other around, and they build up points. It's, it's very complicated in the scoring, but they have to build up points in each event. So it levels the playing field because it's not all about, I tell them, it's not all about speed. It's about solving a problem. It's about building and testing to be effective in each event. You know, you might score really well in five events and really not so well in another and, it re and several others. So it really comes, the, the scores end up being very close. We also award points for sportsmanship because the students that aren't competing, I would say it involves 80% of the students that are competing on teams. The other 20%, um, are doing things like blocking off traffic at the end of the road, so, you know. Um, but they're running the stations, and they see all the teams come through, so they're able to assess which teams really worked the best and add additional points into it. So there's a, so a social dynamic to it as well. And, uh, you know, why not go overboard? We always end up having them make matching, you know, decide on your uniforms. I make a big gear that they pose with and sign. And for all these events, we get their names engraved on a trophy that I keep in my room each year. And finally, the group that I work with in the fall, we've tried a couple of different things. And the one that's stuck for the last few years, we're about to run it for the third time coming up in November, is something called the Rube Run. I used to do a small project with each uh, group in building a Rube Goldberg device where one thing happens and a domino is hit, a marble, which hits something else. And I've always felt, wouldn't it be great if we could do this on a large scale school level. And uh, working with the team of teachers that I work with in the fall, we've been able to do that. Um, so we devised this thing called a Rube Run. We've run it twice. The first year we ran it, it ran through all of the teachers' classrooms, had to start up in the upstairs room and end in the shop. Um, it also, uh, last year we decided, <laughs> that's a little crazy because it takes over the whole school. Let's do it in the auditorium where we can be a little more self-contained and you don't have passing time where people are knocking over all the dominoes. Because if you've ever set up a domino chain, you know it's always when you put that last one in place that, you know, three hours later you have it set up again. So I'll show you a clip from some uh, rube runs that we've done here in the past. Again, this will be our third time. This, uh, these are some videos of the science room and it would just connect from there. I also tell them, think of a big finish. If it really works successfully, it would be really boring to have it end with a marble rolling across the floor and hitting the wall and stopping. So the first year we did it, um, they asked if they could slime me. And I said, if you can pull it off, you can slime me. And they did, and I'll show you a video of that at the end. Uh, last year's big finish, that we worked on was uh, Coke and Mentos explosions at the end. We also try to tie in different, each class is a different team. So they have to have, each period that I have has to have a different academic connection. One group has to use primarily math devices. So you might have uh, calculators instead of dominoes. We use literature books for the group that was assigned the ELA dynamic. We'd have like uh, Newton's cradle, but made out of shop hammers for the class that had my engineering class. This wasn't, uh, this didn't work on the first time, just. I also learned after the first year, don't do it on the last day so you can come back Monday and clean it up. But this really gives the kids a sense of, okay, what has to be really, you know, 
improvements. Nobody wants to buy something that only works some of the time. You have to get it precision. You have to get it to work every time. Find the trouble spots and eliminate them so that you don't get halfway and have to go set it up. And it worked, but it only dribbled a little bit. And I said, oh, whatever, that's successful enough. I told you I'd let you slime me, so. <laughs> I think some of this slime is still on my floor. But uh, anyway, that's, uh, that's the Rube run, and we're looking forward to running that again coming up uh, in another couple, uh, couple weeks in mid-November. So really, all of this we couldn't have done with uh, we couldn't have done without FEF. It's really been, uh, it's a lot of fun. It keeps it enjoyable for me. Hopefully that comes across to the students. Um, it does make a mess, but our administration and our other staff members have always been very tolerant in uh, helping be supportive so that we can pull some of these things off uh, on a school-wide scale. So that's it. Thank you very much. How lucky are we to live in a town that's so supportive of education, to have a school district that is so excellent to have teachers who are so dedicated. Um, FEF is lucky indeed. Um, we have some time for questions. Hope you have some about FEF or about any of the presentations that you saw. Yes. Um, maybe one of the first two presenters could give us an example of, no name, of, of a case. You know, what are the kinds of problems that they're dealing with a little more specific about the bridge program. So a couple of examples to help us understand what kind of problems you um, It could be uh, concussion would be one area that we're working with. Um, we also are dealing with students with anxiety um, that have been um, through a treatment program for that. Um, so that's another example. Um, again, we're new at this, um, so we haven't, but those are primarily the, the conditions that we are, have been working with and have had, have had to work with in previous years, and this program allows for us to support them in school. Thanks, Rebecca. I'm going to give you the mic, Judy. Um, of the Shakespeare group, um, how do you sustain this without FEF funding? Yes, if anyone has any ideas. <laughs> um, we thought we had a foolproof plan because we have a really successful poetry slam with the seventh grade English and we thought, okay, we'll replicate that success. Tons of parents come to support their kids and so we have this shakes off and the kids were super engaged in um, coming and signing up and, and, and so we said, like, bring your parents, we'll ask for suggested donations. And basically we got the logistics wrong um, and we tried, if we did it too late in the day, the kids couldn't participate because they had sports and babysitting and their parents couldn't get them back to school. And if we did it too early in the day, the parents, we, so we tried it at 3.30, I think, and the parents said, well, we can't get out of work, so we can't come. So it didn't work in that regard. But the goal is that if we can build this shakes off into something that the community wants to come see, some kind of like performance or competition aspect, and ask for suggested donations, then we can decrease what we're asking FEF for and hopefully eventually self-sustain it. Um, but plan one didn't work. So we're going back to the drawing board on that. One of the things that, that FEF talks about a lot is the, the continuing program aspect. And what we know is that many of these projects really couldn't happen without FEF support. So do we continue to support? Well, you know, maybe we just do because they're so great. Others? I want to thank all of you for coming. I want to thank our wonderful presenters and our fabulous district. Um, we hope this evening has brought you closer to FEF and its work. We want everyone in our community to know about the Falmouth Education Foundation. And we hope you'll help us spread the word. To learn more and to get involved, visit our website, become a donor, 
attend our annual winter gala on March 2nd. It's a very fun event. Um, walk, run the Falmouth Flag Day 5K on June 16th. We don't run that event, but we are the beneficiaries of it. We're very lucky. Visit a project. We invite you to come with us. Visit a project. There's a survey going out this month to all of our donors. So if you're a current donor, you will get that. Asks you to express an interest, and the program committee will get back to you. Or if you're not a current donor, talk to one of us. Um, communicate through the website. There's contact information. Call the office, and we'll get back to you. Invite us to your organization. We, we are very happy to come and speak um, and, and spread the word that way. So with, with thanks to all of you for, for being here. Good night.